Galera, formato de vídeo para não ter erro, tentei live de novo no OBS, cara. Cara, eu acho que o OBS eu tava vendo ali, por eu usar o Wi-Fi, cai. O live stream não dá isso aí, o stream Wars não dá. E o OBS dá, cara, isso é de graça. Mas igual, vi em formato de vídeo, vou interagir com vocês no chat. Todo superchat é bem-vindo, bem eu tento responder ele ali... Uh... Pessoalmente no chat, se tu quiser fazer uma doação através do Superchat, tu vai estar me ajudando muito também. Pra quem não sabe, sou o David, sou investidor de criptomoedas. Voltando às raízes, vídeos, esperando a StreamWords me liberar minhas lives de novo. Era para ter liberado hoje, mas não liberou. Fui lá acessar o site, ainda não me liberou. Vamos continuar aqui no formato de vídeo até a opção live de novo estar liberada. É uma pena, porque eu gostei muito de fazer lives ao vivo com vocês. Mas vamos estudar, isso que importa. Uh, se tu é novo no canal, seja muito bem-vindo, se inscreva, deixa o like, isso me fortalece muito. Tem a opção Seja Membro também. Na opção Seja Membro, tu vai estar tá apoiando o nosso projeto aqui sobre os estudos de XRP. Eu tento vir diariamente aqui acompanhar com vocês tudo que está envolvendo esse projeto e tudo envolvendo o mundo cripto. Também tem o nosso e-book na descrição do vídeo. Mas sem delongas, vamos estudar, galera, senão vai ficar tarde aqui. Eu tenho que ir a Porto Alegre, voltar lá buscar minha esposa. Vamos estudar, vai ter vídeo, teoria de recompra de novo para o pessoal que está duvidando. Mas vamos às notícias primeiro. SEC dos Estados Unidos aceita o Tuque e LBC. Não é um valor imobiliário e renova a esperança da vitória da Ripple na comunidade XRP. Segundo o texto aqui, saiu lá na gringa. A Comissão de Valores Imobiliários dos Estados Unidos removeu seu processo contra a Libre Inc. Aceitou que o Tuque em si não é um valor imobiliário. O advogado John Ditton citou um documento do um advogado contratual, Lewis, Lewis Cohen, persuadiu o juiz que, de que as transições do mercado secundário da LBC não eram título. Especialista da comunidade XRP acredita que as observações da SEC podem ajudar a garantir uma vitória da Ripple no processo movido contra o regulador financeiro. Eu não acredito em vitória, eu acredito em acordo, mas se vir a vitória é melhor, né? Eu vou ler uma breve, cara, eu não vou ler toda a matéria porque é muita coisa que eu achei. O regulador financeiro dos Estados Unidos resolveu seu caso contra a Live Inc., tornando esperançosos os detentores de XRP na comunidade Ripple como o caso movido pela SEC, tá? Contra a Live Inc. foi semelhante ao processo da gigante pagamento Ripple. O XRP Army monitorou os resultados da. Uh, os resultados de perto, perdão. Deixa eu ver se tem alguma coisa. Vamos ver aqui, ó. Isso aqui seria. Foi o resultado da SEC do contra a Libre, conseguiram a Libre se escapou, galera. A comunidade XRP espera a vitória da Ripple contra a SEC após o julgamento. Recentemente, a decisão foi um alívio para os detentores de XRP da comunidade. A plataforma de remessa de pagamentos transfronteiriça está atualmente enfrentando um processo contra a SEC sobre a venda de tokens XRP. Segundo Jeremy Ong, a decisão indica que a venda de token LBC no mercado secundário não se qualifica como valores imobiliários. Esse argumento pode funcionar a favor do processo contra a SEC. De longa duração, especialistas acreditam que isso implica o XRP também, tá? Isso foi uma boa notícia para quem está querendo saber notícias do processo. A Libre venceu. Eu não acredito em cenário de vitória, sim em cenário de acordo, porque a parada é muito grande. Outra notícia interessante, tá, galera? O CTO da Ripple diz que um grupo de pessoas que criou o Bitcoin pode vender bilhões de dólares. O CTO é o David Schwartz. Uh, fala em uma discussão sobre Satoshi Nakamoto. Em uma polêmica discussão por, pelo Twitter, David Schwartz disse que sua opinião Satoshi Nakamoto e o criador não era uma única pessoa assim, mas um grupo. Quem será? Para mim é David Schwartz e, quem sabe, o Jerry também fez parte disso, dessa criação. Jerry de MacLab, os caras têm potencial para isso. A fala de David ocorreu após um usuário do Twitter declarar que Satoshi não poderia abrir mão do, do, alter ego, do alter ego a qualquer momento resolvendo vender seus bitcoins. Como ninguém consegue comprovar que o criador do bitcoin se foi para sempre, o usuário declarou a pergunta e segue sem respostas. Além disso, declarou que Satoshi Nakamoto fosse um grupo, as chances dele vender as moedas poderiam ainda ser maiores. Aí o David Schultz se posicionou. Uh, ele diz assim, ó, especuladores tentam há anos prever uma volta de Satoshi Nakamoto no mercado, no momento do qual o Bitcoin poderia despencar brutalmente. Isso porque os endereços de Bitcoin associado ao criador têm cerca de 1 bilhão de BTCs guardados e o seu retorno poderia significar uma venda ma em massa das moedas. O que, que o David Schultz falou? Deixa eu ver aqui. 
Isso faz sentido, também pode ter sido um grupo de pessoas e algumas delas morrendo, deixando o restante sem as chaves de acesso. Pode ser, cara. O que uma pessoa só para mim foi o Dave Schwartz, que fez a parada, tá? Uma notícia interessante, movendo sempre o Dave Schwartz. Agora, gurizada, se liga nessa notícia aqui, ó. Eu vou fazer um cafezinho rápido, que depois vem um vídeo longo. Te prepara aí na cadeira pra gente estudar. Ué? Fechou aqui o troço? Ah, não, tá aqui. Uh, a gente sabe que lá no Emirados Árabes tem já a questão da blockchain de comprar imóveis através do XRP Ledger. Olha o que, é que já está saindo no Brasil. Resolução aprovada pelo Conselho Federal de Corretores de Imóvel, a COFES, agora permite que registros de contratos imobiliários por meio da blockchain no Brasil tu consegue comprar imóveis através de blockchain, tá? Isso aqui é uma matéria. Não dá para ouvir o áudio ali, eu tentei também, não abriu. É só uma frase que fica repassando. Vamos ver o que diz aqui a matéria ligeirinho. Tem coisas muito interessantes sobre o XRP. Blockchain pode ser usado no, para registros de contratos imobiliários no Brasil. Mari, Maurício Megaldi destaca no Block Drops a resolução do Conselho Federal de Corretores de Imóvel e outros destaques são o programa da fidelidade da BMW no xadrez da Web3. Segundo aqui, Maurício... Uh, fala sobre a resolução aprovada do Conselho Federal de Corretores de Imóvel, a COFES, que agora permite o registro de contratos imobiliários por meio de blockchain no Brasil. Tá vindo para cá a situação, hein, galera? O CGR permite o registro criptografado a documentos com a segurança de tecnologia blockchain, vinculado à automática de aditivos contratuais e documentos sequenciais, os quais poderão ser acessados a qualquer momento pelos responsáveis pelo registro, inclusive a obtenção de cópias autenticadas. Informa a nova resolução publicada em dezembro de 2022. Aqui ele fala também uma parada da BMW. Não é muito interessante. Para quem não sabe quem é, ele é líder global na, de cripto na consultoria inglesa. Mais de 20 anos. Interessante a notícia, galera. O Brasil já tem a parada de imóveis através da blockchain. Isso aqui é uma situação. Aí está, Ripple Banco. Você pode sentir a tensão, está chegando. Isso aqui foi em... Um vídeo. Pena que fiat currency more efficiently. It's a currency itself today. It's a great question. Who wants to take a bite of that? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, same treatment. It, it has to be a level playing. Teve uma situação hoje no grupo, cara. Deixa eu ver. Eu acho que eu fechei o WhatsApp. Que saiu. Um... Deixa eu ver se eu consigo abrir, cara. Deixa eu abrir outra janela aqui que a Ripple tem capacidade, sim, de virar um banco. Que o cara postou lá o seguinte. A Ripple está confirmando que trabalha com a, os tokens XRP, vamos dizer assim, do varejo, uma parada de quem ele empresta. Mas provavelmente ele te repõe essas moedas. Será que a possibilidade de juro está ainda de pé, galera? Eu sonho muito com essa possibilidade. Cadê a live? Os caras já estão me apertando. Cara, eu tô fazendo o vídeo, tá dando erro a live. Vou até escrever aqui. Deixa eu mandar um áudio que é melhor. A bateria tá indo aqui do celular. Tudo ao vivo comigo. Ô, galera, eu tô ao vivo aqui no, no vídeo. A live caiu, o OBS não tem condições, galera. Então eu tô fazendo o vídeo, não se preocupe, eu já vou postar. Vai ser em formato de vídeo. Larguei lá. Que é o seguinte, Gurizada, voltando aqui. Postaram isso hoje de manhã. Eu sonho muito com esse cenário aqui, tá? Que trabalhar com juros na XRP. Deixa eu ver se eu acho aqui. Ó, foi isso aqui, tá? Se eu não me engano. A empresa de pagamentos Ripple admite usar fundos de clientes para fazer pagamentos globais mais rápidos, seguros e eficientes no desenvolvimento da história. Aí ela tá admitindo, será que o Ripple vai virar um banco mundial, galera? E eu queria muito que isso acontecesse. Aí eu até botei, se for que nem bancos e depois dar juros, seria ótimo. Eu acredito muito. Se isso fosse, nós estaríamos grandão na parada. Tá? Achei muito interessante. Vamos para outra matéria, Gurizada, que tem mais uma condição ainda para a gente estudar. São dois vídeos, tá? Na gringa. Real Digital vem aí. Qual a diferença das moedas digitais para outros países? Achei interessante também, trouxe para vocês. Atualmente, mais de 90 países têm projetos CBDCs em diferentes estágios com desenhos distintos. 
O brasileiro que se acostumou com o Pix poderá ver em breve. Uh, em breve, de frente, com mais uma mudança no dinheiro. Real Digital, a nova versão da moeda que está em desenvolvimento, deve ser piloto ainda na, na rua do primeiro semestre de 2023, nesse ano, tá? A novidade se enquadra que vem sendo chamado de moeda digitais CBDC, a sigla em inglês. Ao contrário do Pix, quem criou o canal de pagamentos mais ágil sem mexer no mecanismo base da moeda, o Real Digital tem a pretensão de implementar mudanças mais fundamentais dessa vez que trazer funções e não visitas no mercado financeiro. O Pix é a evolução do TED e do DOC, com certeza, a melhor coisa que aconteceu. O Real Digital não tem exatamente o paralelo que é algo que faça acontecer no dia a dia das pessoas. Daí vem a questão aquela do Real Digital e a tokenização. A gente vai ficar no aguardo. Ah, cara, parece que me acham quando eu estou gravando. Desculpe, botei no não perturbe. Ao contrário do Pix, que criou o canal de pagamentos mais ágil sem mexer no mecanismo de base da moeda, o Real Digital tem a pretensão de implementar mudanças mais fundamentais para dessa vez trazer funções ainda mais vistas no mercado financeiro. Se o Pix é uma evolução do TED e do DOC, o Real Digital não tem exatamente o um paralelo com algo que faça o dia a dia das pessoas. O Brasil está longe de testar um CBDC, de acordo com a plataforma CBDC Tracker, apoiada por organizações de Boston, Housing Group, em e Y, para mapear a iniciativa de moeda digital, atualmente mais de 90 países têm projetos de CBDCs digitais. Na falta de poderização vindo da Basileia, onde fica o Banco Central dos Bancos Centrais, esse projeto ganha forma independente, deixando cada um diferente do outro. Cada país está fazendo seus testes, tá? O mais confirmado é o One Digital, mas eu acredito que o Real Digital também está bem adiantado. E agora nós vamos para que realmente interessa. Agora um momentinho assim, se tu quiser uh, conversar comigo, eu vou atualizar ali o chat, eu vou tentar responder. Por vídeo é complicado, mas eu vou tentar acompanhar o vídeo com vocês na íntegra. Uh, e a gente, eu interajo com vocês via chat. Cara, eu não vejo a hora de poder fazer as lives novamente. A live é muito bacana que você interage ao vivo com, com o inscrito, né? Felizmente, pelo OBS, não tá rolando aqui em casa, galera. Eu não tenho estúdio pro, vocês estão vendo. Eu gravo em casa, numa cozinha, na minha cozinha aqui, e vim interagir. Na live, no stream mod, estava bem de boa de fazer. Vim pro OBS, pela questão de ser free, não tá rolando. Cai toda hora a live. Uh, eu, eu vi que é uma possibilidade do Wi-Fi, não tem como eu configurar o Wi-Fi, daí eu teria que configurar o OBS, cara, eu não vou mexer ali quando eu ver, eu faço mais merda ainda. <risos> então, felizmente, quando a, o Streamworks uh, me liberar de novo, a gente faz, porque o Streamworks não dava nada de problema, cara, eu iniciava a live, show de bola, estudava com vocês ao vivo, vocês vinham, cair, não caía nada. Agora o um OBS cai. Quem sabe aí vocês me ajudando aí, sendo membro, uh, fazendo doação de superchat, comprando meu e-book aí, com a galera consiga migrar e comprar o plano para a gente fazer live todos os dias. Mas igual, estamos ainda no formato de vídeo, não dá para reclamar. Comecei o canal assim, né? Se liga nesse vídeo de, do Zac Raffel. Segundo ele, aconteceu um reset durante a noite. Vamos ver aí o que, que rolou. Vamos prestar atenção no que ele vai dizer. Português, maximizei a tela, deixa eu ajeitar a velocidade, né, galera? Pera aí. Botar o áudio. Bora pro vídeo. Imagine waking up and your currency has been devalued 90%. That is the case in Lebanon, as a matter of fact. Check this out, guys. The Central Bank of Lebanon has announced it will further devalue its currency by 90% effective February 1st. A new official exchange rate of 15,000 pounds per USD previously was 1,500 Lebanese pounds to the USD. The perceived value of Lebanese fiat is vanished overnight. So while many people thought that the overnight memes in the XRP community were just riddles, not the case. It's actually how it is playing out in real time. As you can see, in Lebanon, Central Bank, what's the problem with a sovereign debt crisis? What do we do? We devalue the currency by 90%. That is the solution. And this is just one of many countries. Segundo ele, a moeda do Líbano desvalorizou 90% durante a noite. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking, right? This can't happen in the United States. This can't happen in my country. This is only in these these far off countries. They have much more serious problems than us. You're wrong. I covered last night in my live stream that the sovereign wealth fund of Norway lost 164 billion dollars. Okay, a record loss. And this is added to all the other record losses that are being reported by central banks. And then what do we see on the balance sheet? A record amount of liabilities and debt that these countries have racked up and have obligations to pay out. 
How are they going, going to do it? It's going to be devaluing your currency. <laughs> what are you going to do? Now, some guys say hold Bitcoin. Some say hold gold. <laughs> I pick up silver. I pick up XRP. And you bet I'm going to be ready to buy some real estate this year as well. We're positioned for all the assets. <laughs> you already know the deal. And be ready because this can happen to you. Okay. 90% overnight in Lebanon. Just Meu one livro. of many. Let's stay tapped in, guys. Appreciate you. Interessante, Luiz. Viu como acontece as coisas durante o nosso sono? O mundo não para, né, galera? Imagina tu acordar e ver a valorização do XRP, cara. Que sonho. É o que eu, que eu imagino. Hoje eu tive uma ideia bacana com o Eri. O Eri é um dos inscritos aí. E a gente tava conversando dessas situações, cara. A gente tá atrás de momentos pra viver tranquilo essa vida. Com a nossa família, né? O dinheiro é muito bom porque te proporciona isso. Agora vamos pro vídeo, gurizada. Esse vídeo... A princípio, consegui ativar a tradução, galera. Não sei o porquê ontem não foi. Será que não foi o OBS que deu algum conflito? É o vídeo da Mole. Deixa eu configurar aqui, tá? But before we get into that, Matt... Tá, português. I would love... Oh. Software. So Ué, desativou, tá? eu tinha traduzido aquela hora. Deixa eu ver se agora eu consigo traduzir. Ó, viu? Consegui, galera. Vamos ver o que, que eles vão falar. Seria as teorias. O Molly vem com essas hipóteses que acha impossível a teoria de recompra. Vamos ver o que eles vão falar. Oh, Actually, I, I thought nothing much of it. I thought, well, that's interesting, but it's never going to catch on, which was probably first big mistake. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, even, I even think I mined a little bit at the start, um, you know, back in the early days, and uh, I've, I've, I've searched back to try and find it. I can't find any, uh, any, uh, any old wallets or anything. Okay. Um, but uh, one of the guys who worked for me in a web development firm, he, as we, we ran a data center, he started mining Bitcoin in it. And uh, as a thank you at the end, when we, you know, kind of uh, finally, when we wound the company down about 16 years or so later, uh, he gave me, he'd sold a bunch of his Bitcoin for XRP. This was early 2017, I think it was. Okay. And he gave me some of this XRP and he said, you know, this is just a present for letting me mine Bitcoin in the office. Thanks very much. Uh, it's not worth much. One day it might be enough to put a down payment on a car. Um, here you go. Right. And uh, by this point, I was working for a startup based in Los Angeles that was a health, nutrition, uh, fitness tracking app that okay. was being developed by a, a, a woman based um, in uh, opposite UCLA. And I was in charge of the mobile development team kind of building that. We're building that over about three years. It was privately funded by her. And then lo and behold, by the end on in the last year, because it's open. The liaisoning, what does that mean, developer relations? So developer relations is kind of a, a link between the developer community and the company, okay. right? So the idea being is that you help developers build stuff by educating them, okay. uh, learning how the technology works, helping them understand the technology. Entendi, you you get involved with things like hackathons, uh, coding competitions, um, uh, things like uh, funding rounds, grant funding, that sort of thing, and, and helping inform the company as well what's going on in the ecosystem. Right, so you're kind of the pulse of what's going on in the ecosystem and the developers and uh, helping the company find out. Now, it's kind of very strange doing this for the XRP ledger because it's open and decentralized. You don't know who's using it, right? There's no way to know that somebody is using the XRP ledger until they come and tell you, right? You might yeah. be able to infer something by looking at the network, but it's not like, you know, when I was at IBM, IBM Cloud, the main kind of KPI, the main metric I was measured on was how many signups do we have to IBM Cloud? Right. And ultimately, how many go from a, a free tier to a paid tier? And so that was kind of the metric that I was measured on. Whereas with something like a, an, an open blockchain, there, there's no you know, API key you have to get. Anybody can build on it. So it's very difficult to find out who is actually building on it. So it's all about kind of very much soft skills, building relationships. Uh, I went along to, you know, a number of events and, you know, was talking to developers. I ran a live Twitch stream once a week for about a year. Um, getting okay. developers on to come and showcase what they were building, walking through code, examples, um, that kind Are of thing. Are developers pretty open that like they collaborate with each other and ask each other questions so that you didn't have to sort of try to figure out who's building? Yeah, yeah, they were. I mean, what was amazing was actually whilst I was doing the live Twitch streams, um, there would be people asking questions in the chat as we were talking, okay. and other people then started to come and answer those questions, you know, before I got to them even, right? Um, so before, you know, I got a chance to kind of say them out loud, somebody had responded in the in the chat. So that was pretty cool. And then we uh, launched, while I was at Ripple, launched the um, XRP Ledger Grants program. Okay. Um, 
So he's now in, I think, about the fourth uh, fourth round of grants, I think. Is the idea that Ripple has a vested, vested interest in the XRP ledger succeeding, so they're just sort of helping to raise all rising tide lifts all ships kind of idea? Exactly, exactly. So Ripple split into two divisions, Ripple Net and Ripple X. Okay. Ripple Network's on the traditional the uh, banking side Ripple. of things, and the Ripple Net Network, which is a totally separate network to the XRP ledger. So Ripple Net is a closed, permissioned, um, proprietary network that is used by Ripple clients to communicate with each other and okay. is worked within a, a regulated environment within the, the financial industry. And the XRP ledger is open, decentralized, permissionless, um, is you know e existing within an uncertain regulatory environment. And uh, I was on the Ripple X side, so I was dealing okay. with the XRP ledger specifically. Are they like um, separate companies, like different offices, different teams, or is there? Um, they're, they're not separate companies. There's separate business units within okay. within the company, and there was some crossover between them. And so there was some. I mean, there were some common functions that would support both sides. Some of the you know the marketing and, and comm side, for example. Um, but at the time I was there, I think there was about probably about two thirds of the headcount were Ripple Net, and probably about one third was was Ripple X. And what's um, Ripple so X's business model? Like, how do they make money? Good question. <laughs> uh, Ripple X didn't really have a business model. I mean, Ripple X was all about just getting adoption for the XRP ledger. So I guess ultimately, at the end of the day, Ripple hold a large amount of XRP. If that goes up in value, that's good for the company, right? So if you have more developers building, then that's that's advantageous. Um, and you know, helping other developers build uh, was was part of what they were trying to do. Um, so it, it was it was kind of a strange thing, especially when I mean, I, I literally signed my contract the day the SEC lawsuit hit, right? So I actually had up on the screen the SEC lawsuit and my employment <laughs> contract, and I was reading through both of them, and I'm like, this is either going to be the smartest or the, the, the stupidest move I've made. Um, and I decided to go for it, and it was it was great. I mean, it was uh, it was great working at Ripple and working with some fantastic people and finally, you know, kind of getting to do kind of in my day job and be paid to do what I've been doing a lot of, you know, in my in my free time, right? So Now, was the lawsuit a cloud over, like, the culture there, or did people just not care? It was, I, I think it was a strange one. I think a lot of people, so the interesting thing within Ripple is that there's a, because like I said, about two thirds were involved in Ripple Net and you had all the, you know, the ancillary functions, recruitment, marketing, comms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. A lot of them didn't have that deeper knowledge of XRP or the XRP ledger. There's a, there's a core team. Um, there's a people like sort of David Schwartz, uh, Nick Bugalis and the whole C++ team that worked on Ripple D uh, under Nick Bugalis, who very much understood how the XRP ledger worked and people like Elliot Lee um, and then, you know, just before I left uh, Abner Pinto that, that, that joined as well, kind of people like that were very much involved, you know, understanding the XRP ledger, but it was slightly surprising the number of times I had to explain it even within with even within Ripple, right? So, um, and, and, and it's difficult, right? Because the XRP ledger is decentralized because you have no ultimate control. So, I mean, a good example is XLS20, the NFT uh, amendment that happened. Okay. You know, for people who don't know, amendments, changes to the protocol and new features come out as amendments on the network and they have to be voted on by the validators and they have to have 80% support for two weeks in order to be ratified. Okay. And we would have kind of project managers within Ripple who were working on some of the code and working on some of the relationships with big brands about NFT saying, you know, we're going to launch this on the 1st of November. And I'm kind of turning around saying, well, that's not your decision to make, right? That's up to the network whether the participants vote on it, and you've got about at the time five percent vote. So you know you 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 you've got to ensure that everybody else on the network is enthused about this. And so it was it was a little bit of a interesting kind of culture uh, between I think those that really fully understood, you know, Web three decentralized network cryptocurrencies, and those that came from the more traditional corporate background and came from traditional finance and whatever. I think there was a um, a, a a bit of a kind of sometimes difference between how they approach things that, that uh, could could do with being better, perhaps, should we say. Sort of a little bit like team banking, team tech, and kind of squabbling over the vision of the company? Yeah. Or what do you think they disagreed on? It's it's not so much that they disagreed. I mean, it's just they were both involved in what they were doing, right? So in, even in team banking, within RippleNet, you had a whole technical division, right? I mean, RippleNet is a software product that is built by Ripple and, you know, licensed to to financial institutions to use, but they're very much like any other corporate, like enterprise software business. They could be selling databases or CRM software or, or you know, whatever, um, ERP software. And it, it would be pretty much the same kind of structure. You've got an engineering team, you've got a sales team, you've got management, you've got et cetera, et cetera, kind of all okay. working around that. Um, and then Ripple X was this kind of this wild bunch within there that were working in this strange crypto stuff, right? So it was a it was a kind of a slightly strange feeling there, I think, at times in, in this kind of duality within the within the company. Did they ever bring developers like you over to the Ripple Net side to sell the banking world? Or was it kind of kept separate? 
not so much to sell into the banking world. Um, I mean, where it started to kind of cross over were things like ODL, so Ripple's on-demand liquidity product, right? That allowed mm-hmm. RippleNet to access liquidity from the XRP ledger. So that was kind of where the two sides kind of met. And also some of the products that they were working on, um, like Liquidity Hub, for example, um, in which was a, a system to allow any regular company to buy very early on, right, um, in a previous company, because the SEC alleged that this whole, what would now we would call DeFi, right, okay. this was before cryptocurrencies even existed, uh, but this was peer-to-peer lending between people that uh, they were not that happy with, right, because the SEC were like, well, how do we regulate this, what's it regulated as, et cetera, et cetera, and so Chris Larson went toe-to-toe with the SEC, um, and <laughs> Uh, I believe they settled. I can't remember the yeah. exact specifics, but I, I believe they, they they came to some settlement. But you know, so from the early days, you know, Ripple were kind of taking on the the market. But then with the FinCEN uh, situation, so FinCEN in 2015, I think it was FinCEN kind of um, you know slapped Ripple on the wrist and said you are selling an unlicensed, uh, sorry, you are acting as an unlicensed money service bureau. You are handling a, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but basically virtual currency. Mm-hmm. And so they deemed it a virtual currency and slapped Ripple on the wrist for not having a money service bureau license. So I mean, this is where the absurdity of the regulation in the US comes down, you know, because they're like, okay, we've got one regulator saying, you know, slapping you on the wrist for, for you know, selling something as a currency. And then you've got another one slapping you on the wrist for claiming, you know, for, for alleging that you're selling a unlicensed security. And it's kind of like, actually, technically, both of those things can be true, but it just makes no sense, you know, that, you know, that's the situation, right? right. So. It, it, it is a bit weird, but that FinCEN agreement, as, as part of that, Ripple had to agree to shut down their um, web wallet. They, they had a system called Ripple Trade that was a web-based wallet. They had to shut that down. They had to try and KYC a bunch of customers, existing customers, which was very difficult to kind of to do because you've got all of these customers, you don't know who they are, and then you're trying to KYC them after the fact is, is, is very difficult. And then uh, they had to stop selling XRP to retail. So this kind of started, I think, the whole pivot with Ripple towards aiming directly towards, you know, the financial institutions themselves rather than aiming towards the individuals, right? So they were kind of moving up up the food chain, I suppose, and, you know, making the likes of, you know, the, the remittance companies that we now see as their customers, uh, you know, having them as their customers rather than competing with them. Interesting. Well, what if, thank you for that background. I you filled in a bunch of gaps for me. All right, let's hop over to tokenization because I know that's what people are interested for us to kind of get into this idea. And if you aren't familiar with what I'm talking about, uh, one of the models that the committee that I'm working on has put out is a collateralization model to value XRP in a simulated scenario, kind of pretending had the lawsuit never happened and XRP adoption had continued as it was intended. What would the value have been in 2030? And then we kind of net present value back to today. So there was a lot, brought up a lot of questions about it. So let's just dive into how do you explain the idea of tokenization to people so we can kind of get on the same page? Right. So uh, the XRP ledger was the first blockchain that allowed tokenization, right? Back from when it was when it first went live in uh, 2012, 2013, um, it was the first X, uh, the first blockchain that had tokenization. Now, bear in mind that the only other blockchain at the time was Bitcoin. Uh, Litecoin came out about the same time, and that was a fork of, of ah, Bitcoin. So basically, did exactly what Bitcoin did, just slightly really different. Than than the the value of oh, it says I promise to pay the bet. You're like XRP ledger. Does it have to have tokenization? Because Elon Musk tweeted something, and there we go. Right. We have that in the physical world. Like you know, I use the analogy of you could have two pairs of jeans. One is like some Walmart jeans, and another one is some luxury designer jeans. Intrinsic value based on the ingredients, material cost is the same, but it's now six dollars same product, but the circumstances are different. Can't that happen with digital assets too, that I just don't know where the cheap price is, so I buy it wherever I see it? They can do to a degree. They can do to a degree, but nowhere near to that level because digital assets are global. They're tradable. They're, you know, wherever. So, you know, the difference between your bottle of water in a gas station and your bottle of water in a desert is you're stuck in a desert, right? Now, you can't get out of that desert easily. I mean, if you could just click your fingers and be at the gas station, you would have bought it for a dollar, right? Why would you buy it for $6 in the desert if you could just, you know, click your heels, your ruby slippers, and suddenly you're back at the gas station and you can you can buy it for a dollar? Well, with digital assets like the XRP Ledger, you can do that, right? I mean, if I'm if I've got a market buying and selling them, I'm based it here in Barbados. If I've got a market saying I'm willing to, um, you know, whatever, sell XRP for five dollars, um, and you're willing to, you know sell it for a dollar, then why would they buy it off of me when they could equally buy it off of you? You know, the, the XRP ledger is decentralized. Barbados is no closer to them than, than, than where you are because it's it's all global, right? It's all interconnected. Right. The XRP ledger doesn't have a central point. So let's say know, though, pra- let's say you did something like RippleNet. You and your friends create a private ledger and you're like, hey, you know what? We like to play poker. And right. when we settle up our bets at the end of the night, we're going to pay each other an XRP. And just to keep things simple in our private 
poker room, we're going to value XRP at $10,000 a token. And right. we're just going to exchange value that way in this closed system. Like, is that a technical issue from your perspective? So, I mean, that's fine. You can do that within your closed network, but that right. only works one, within your closed yeah. thousand, right? One is, is you arbitrage. That is where it's worth 10. This is where I think the question has come up around, could the value be different if you had a bunch of these private networks? Okay, so potentially, but there's two there's two problems with that kind of scenario. One is you would have to ensure that there is no connection to the outside world, right? Okay. With that, because the instant that somebody can go and sell that 10,000 XRP on the open market and get 10,000 for it, they're going to do it, right? Okay. What, 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 what's going to stop massive flow? Of Galera, eu tô pulando aqui para ver se tem uma coisa, literally did not dizer, allow muito técnico, any XRP be traded across the boundary between that private network and the public network. Okay. In doing so, you've effectively created something that is no longer XRP. Okay. Right? It, 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 it's kind of like if if we're both selling whatever, if we're both selling apples and um, and one of us decides that actually we're going to call these oranges, if we all agree that they're oranges, then they're oranges, right? I mean, okay. uh, you know, as long as no none of us kind of look over the fence and go, wait a minute, that's not an orange, that's an apple, then then we can then we can believe whatever we want as long as you keep that in a private, you know, totally you know um, isolated network. Now, Rome Vostro account. Well, the thing being is because it's because both a buy and a sell is happening, it mm -hmm. effectively equals out in the market on a global sense, right? There might be some regional differences if the flows are, say, say all of the flow is going from Barbados to the US, say, then that would mean there'd be a lot of buy pressure for XRP in Barbados and a lot of sell pressure for XRP in the US. So that means the price of XRP in Barbados locally would go up, the price of XRP in the US would go down. Now, arbitragers, again, would see that. Okay. And so they would say, well, hey, I can buy XRP cheap in the US and I can sell it in Barbados and make a make a profit because it's 10% higher there. So they would buy it in the US and sell it in Barbados. And that causes the price to then come back again because the buy pressure in the US causes the price to go up and the sell pressure in Barbados causes the price to go down. So they, they even out again. Right. right. So our arbitragers working on the, in this background cause these price uh, the, the prices to effectively equalize uh, because they're kind of a balancing pressure to things that are happening like ODL. Um, going on there but the actual value of xrp is not really that important for that transaction right because say i'm sending you you know a hundred us dollars worth and okay. if xrp is one dollar then i need a hundred xrp to make that transaction right so okay. um my 200 barbados dollars buys 100 xrp sends it to the us and is sold for 100 us volume on the network and for a start you have fee é, from you in the future at a specific falando, price tá you've got to make sure that you have that so if when the time comes you can't be like oops i spent it on something else right and so the right. futures market would that require then to pull xrp out of the available supply for those transactions but potentially yes potentially it would do and again that comes down to the regulatory kind of things that, that surround that i mean because what you've what you've described is you must hold it well that's a regulation right um if, if you say you must hold the xrp to back that that's that's a that's a regulatory thing that's a that's a, a legal requirement or regulatory requirement claro, and again there's, there's a question of well aqui. which regulatory ele não é muito convicto eu ia de recompra ele a molly entrevistou ele porque a molly acredita na teoria de recompra um regime regime in, um, is, that, is that a us offered product and, and subject to us um regulation uh or is this a whatever a singaporean project product and, and under singaporean regulation some particular time but that's only if you're doing like an odl type transaction you don't have to do that right to xrp and then everybody makes their um their value of us dollars to xrp uh valuation you put out seems to be we tokenize everything and then we divide it by the number of xrp in in circulation and that's that's just incorrect because the value of xrp is, is independent of the tokenized assets right it will hopefully go up in value assets that are represented on there and that was just kind of the moon it's like no i, I can't right i can i can jump half a meter in the air that's that's it i'm not gonna get to the moon so you know i think i think that's people read those valuations and go, oh, well, it could be $150,000 or whatever, $135,000 per XRP. And I, th I think that's where, you know, my personal kind of criticism of that comes in because it's it's just it's just not feasible, right? It's, so it's just Just feasible. give you a counter is, um, one, it's intended to be an extreme scenario, like a worst or best case scenario in the event there was ever a class action lawsuit. So they're like, we have to look at, you know, if, if you, I think it's just right, right? Your, your house because they're going to put a highway through or, or, or whatever right. i'm saying okay, if i cut my hand off now what would my earnings be if i were to become a surgeon if i were to publish that paper uh, that makes me famous that then gets me and then i get this hollywood contract to, to do plastic surgery to all these aliens whatever it might or, or cure cancer or whatever right okay. um you, you're making so many steps there and any kind of like I, i see what you're saying in that okay this is meant to be a worst case scenario to defend against the, the government coming and buying it back and yada 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 um you know any kind of like 
eminent domain type argument, which is what will come about from like, you know, uh, the government wants to buy your, your house because they're going to put a highway through it. Right. And right. they come to you, and they say, we want to buy your house. Uh, we're going to offer you a hundred thousand. And you turn around and say, well, no, actually it should be worth more. Right. Yeah. A judge is going to look at uh, kind of the appraisal methodologies and look and see if they're reasonable. Now, if you're coming in and saying, well, I'm basing this based upon the fact that all of the value in the world is going to be transacted and it's all going to be transacted instantaneously, the judge is going to laugh at you, right? They're just going to say that is just completely, you know, irresponsible. It's inappropriate. It's it's not going to not going to happen. And then they're going to look down at the methodology and they're going to say, well, you've assumed the price of XRP is the same price as the tokenized assets. You've not taken into account that you can only trade half of it at one go. So, you know, your, your, your methodology is inaccurate. So at the end of the day, the, you know, it's going to be thrown out, right? So, you know, some, you know, I understand what you're saying about trying to come up with some sort of appraisal method. My personal view, I've right. made this quite clear, is I don't think it's ever going to happen that the US government's going to buy back XRP. Um, ah, but even if it does... É, eu me lembrei, ele não acredita na compra do XRP. Só é um cara que ele trabalhou lá e saiu. Não sei por que que ele saiu. Mas, cara, eu, eu não duvido nada desse mercado. E ele era um cara ligado, ele deve ter, sim, alguma informação, mas ele fica neutro. Does happen. I think the, the, the valuation, you are um, one conflating tokenized assets with the native asset in which there's okay. a very big you know difference and and two you are looking at future speculative value that hasn't yet happened right, right. if you look at you look at the valuation model you're probably familiar with the model that um uh Michnik, robert Michnik and That's susan Michnik. Mm -hmm. yeah so that was 2018 i think it was end of 2018 middle 2018 um so they did a valuation Susan Athey was on the board of directors of Ripple. Um, she's university lecturer, I think. I can't remember exactly. Um, and uh, something like that in their, in their you know, knowledge of 18. Cara, tá bem there. menor nesse vídeo aqui. Pensei que ia ser mais empolgante. Nem ser sincero. Bom, agora dá para ver. Ele não é muito fã. Me lembrei dele. Isso aí, galera. Foi um vídeo rápido, 36 minutos, comparado com a live. Espero que tu tenha curtido as informações. A gente viu ali o vídeo da mole, achei meio... Bem aguinha, sem açúcar. <risos> Mas foi bom. Foi... Adquiriu algum certo conhecimento. Tem... Teve as notícias que a gente avaliou. Então, a gente está voltando no formato de vídeo, tá, galera? Espero que tu tenha curtido. Até o próximo cafezinho. Fechou. Grande abraço.